all anisotropic crystals cause double refraction. When a polarized beam of light enters a crystal from below, it's split into two rays, a slow ray and a fast ray. When the two rays leave the crystal, the fast ray is ahead of the slow ray by some distance called the retardation. Consider a beam of violet colored light. After double refraction, there's become two rays vibrating perpendicularly to each other. And these rays may or may not be in phase, but they cannot interfere because they are not following the same path and because they're vibrating in different directions. But when the two rays get to the upper polarizer, some optic magic takes place. The upper polarizer lets their north-south components pass through while blocking their east-west components. The filter absorbs the east-west vibrations of the light. And above the upper filter, the waves are now vibrating in the same plane, and so they can interfere. If they are in phase, they can add constructively and we see light. And if they are out of phase, they can add destructively and we will see less light or no light at all. The amount of light we see will change during stage rotation because the intensities of the two rays change. The grain will go extinct every 90 degrees and it will have maximum brightness halfway between extinction angles. This same phenomenon occurs for waves of all wavelengths. The drawing here shows the standard red, orange, yellow, green, blue, violet colors, but of course there are many, many other colors and they're all traveling the same direction. Above the upper polarizer, some of these colors will be in phase and some will not. So some will add and become enhanced and others will become diminished. In the example I show here, the green and the blue hues are suppressed and almost all the orange gets through with lesser amounts of red, yellow, and violet. And these colors will combine and the result is that we might see an orangey magenta color when we look down the microscope tube. The orangey magenta color that we see is an interference color. It is the color we perceive, but it's really the color of many different wavelengths of light combined. If we rotate the stage, the relative intensities of the slow rays and fast rays will change, but they're going to change differently for each wavelength. So the interference colors will change. But every 90 degrees, the grain will go extinct, and at 45 degrees to the extinction angles, we will see the maximum interference colors possible. There are some additional complications. If double refraction occurs and the waves are in phase when they leave the crystal, it could be that the slow ray and the fast ray are perfectly in phase because there was no retardation. But it could also be that the slow ray is exactly one wavelength behind the fast ray. Or the slow ray could be two wavelengths behind the fast ray, or three or four. All that matters is the difference between the slow ray and the fast ray has to be an integral number of wavelengths. If so, the waves will be in phase. And the same thing applies for destructive interference. Waves that are interfering destructively could differ by one half wavelength or one and a half wavelengths, or two and a half, and so forth. So we may see different order interference colors that appear in almost the same hues, but they're different because the number of wavelengths between the slow and the fast rays are different. Retardation depends on birefringence, which is the difference in refractive index for the slow and fast rays, and it also depends on sample thickness. So this chart shows birefringence across the bottom and thickness vertically. It's called a wraith sorensen chart. Retardation increases diagonally from zero in the bottom left corner to about 3,000 nanometers in the upper right. Interference colors vary in hue and intensity with stage rotation, so we only see these colors if we rotate the stage and look for maximum interference colors. And we also need to look at multiple grains of the same mineral because some of them could be oriented wrong so they don't show much in the way of interference colors at all. Grains that are very thin or that have very low birefringence will only show black, gray, or white colors 
Grains that are a little bit thicker will begin to show yellows and pinks and blues and things, and the colors repeat as retardation increases. Overall, the colors become less pronounced as retardation goes to greater and greater values. This chart, called the Michel Levy chart, shows the same information as the previous chart, but the axes have been changed. Retardation is across the bottom, thickness is vertical. The Michel Levy chart is more commonly used by mineralogists and petrologists than the Ray Sorensen chart we just looked at. The diagonal lines here are lines of equal birefringence, and the values of birefringence are written across the top and down the right hand side of the chart. The advantage using this kind of chart is color swatches are vertical corresponding to different values of retardation. Normal thin sections are 0.03 millimeters thick, which is equivalent to 30 microns. So this is a slice through the Michel Levy chart for that thickness. And I've put some mineral names on here to show typical maximum interference colors for some common minerals. Very low order colors corresponding to retardation of less than about 200 nanometers are black, gray, and white. If retardation is slightly greater, we see yellow, orange, or red interference colors. With even greater retardation, we see the same colors beginning to repeat. But as we move to higher and higher order, the colors become more pastel and more washed out. The colors are repeating every 550 nanometers, which is the average wavelength of white light. The repeating is because, as we said before, it doesn't matter whether two waves are separated by one wavelength or two wavelengths or three or four, they can still be in phase. So we end up with first order, second order, third order, and fourth order colors. For routine mineral identification, the order of interference colors is often more important than the actual color because a lot of things, including sample thickness, can cause colors to vary. So we might say that Hornblende as middle to upper second order colors and not worry about whether it was pink or orange or yellow. Typical minerals that display low order interference colors include quartz and the feldspars. In these two views we see large grains of quartz and in the top view we can see perthite which is a potassium feldspar. Perthite displays a wormy texture due to X solution the X solution produced parallel zones with slightly different optical properties. Note that the quartz grain, especially apparent in the bottom view, has patchy or blobby interference colors. This is typical for quartz and helps identify it. If you rotate the grain, different parts of the grain will go extinct at slightly different angles. This is called undulatory extinction, and quartz is one of a few minerals that show it commonly. On the left hand side in the bottom photo, there is one flake of biotite. The biotite shows higher order, middle order interference colors compared to the quartz and feldspar. Here is another example of interference colors in feldspar. This is plagioclase showing typical zebra stripe twinning. The interference colors vary from black to white to gray as you rotate the stage. The thin section also contains hornblende, which shows higher order, second, or maybe third order interference colors. And there is one flake of mica up here, which also shows higher order interference colors. Some minerals, and chlorite is a great example, display what we call anomalous interference colors. And we call them anomalous because they don't show up on the normal interference color chart. Anomalous interference colors are caused by two things most of the time. Either the mineral has very low birefringence, this can give very strange interference colors, or the mineral is naturally colored and the strong natural color of the mineral masks the interference colors. You can see an interesting texture in this bottom view. There's biotite, which sort of has a pebbly, a middle to upper order interference color pattern which is altering to an inky blue chlorite. So the biotite was turning into a low temperature mineral, but the reaction 
never went to completion before the rock was done reacting. Here are two views of the same thin section. The top one is plain polarized light. The bottom one is cross polarized light. In the top view, you can see a large grain of clinopyroxene in the middle that shows great cleavage. In the bottom, we see it has middle second order colors. We can also see orthopyroxene in these photos. In the plain polarized view, it shows slightly greater relief than the clinopyroxene. And in the cross polarized view, we see first order interference colors. Orthopyroxene commonly has first order colors, and clinopyroxene commonly has higher order colors, and that's one way we tell the two minerals apart. Notice also in the top view, the plain polarized view, we can see a green grain of spinel. Spinel is an isotropic mineral, so it remains black under cross polarized light. Here we see two views of epidote and cross polars. In the photo on the left, the epidote has quite high order interference colors, and it's surrounded by grains with gray interference colors. Those are quartz. In the view on the right, we can see that the epidote has patchy or blobby interference colors. On the left, it almost looks like there's rings of color around the grains. Variable color within one grain is typical for epidote, and is often a good way to identify it in thin section. You can see on the left also that epidote has significantly higher relief than the quartz around it. Here is another view showing epidote with very blotchy interference colors. The grain in the middle of this view is olivine. Olivine has slightly greater birefringence than epidote. Olivine also has no cleavage, although you can see some fractures in this grain. Below and to the right of the olivine, there is a grain of pyroxene. This grain shows cleavage, which is one way we can sometimes tell olivine from pyroxene in thin section. Some minerals have such high birefringence that interference colors do not plot on any normal chart. Titanite, calcite, and dolomite are good examples. So here we see a grain of titanite. The birefringence is so high, it's really hard to tell what the interference colors actually are. If we wanted to plot titanite's birefringence on the chart that we were just looking at, the chart would have to be three times wider to get it on scale. Titanite often shows this classic wedge shape you see here. It's called a sphenoid shape. And the old name of titanite was sphene. Calcite has even greater birefringence than titanite. But both titanite and calcite have extremely high order interference colors, so high that we can't even estimate what order they are. And sometimes these colors appear almost white. If we're confused about whether interference colors are very, very high, washed out pastels, or are white, we can insert the accessory plate. Because when we insert the accessory plate, we add retardation. And if the minerals already have great retardation, interference colors will not change when we put in the accessory plate. But if we're looking at something with white or gray interference colors and we put in the accessory plate, the colors will change to higher order. One important diagnostic feature for calcite is twinning. You can see it here in this cross polarized view as diagonal intersecting lines and stripes. Sometimes the twinning is visible in plain polarized light as well. We saw this view just a minute ago when we were talking about olivine. The grain in the center is olivine, but most of the material around it is calcite. You can see vague twinning in these grains, but seeing interference colors requires a very active imagination or perhaps an exceptionally sharp eye.